Christopher R. Browning, Part 3, Terror and Typhus, Fall 1942 to Spring 1943. Chapter 10, Personalities and Structures. The experience of the Jewish prisoner community, now enslaved in the factory camps of Strakowice, would be determined by two sets of personalities. The German factory and camp managers and guards on the one hand, and the privileged Jewish prisoners whom the Germans empowered to control the internal affairs of the camps on the other. These personalities operated within the typical structures of German factories and labor camps in the occupied territories of the Nazi empire, but nonetheless left their own indelible imprints. Two names dominate the memory of Strakowice survivors as symbols of what shaped particularly shaped the particular experience, camp culture, and social hierarchy of their prisoner community. They are Ralph, Alois, Willie, Althoff, the first commander of factory security, and Jeremiah Wilczek, the head of the Jewish camp police, or Lager Polizei. In September 1939, the steelworks and munitions factory in Strakowice, previously owned by the Polish government, had been taken over by the Reichsschwerg Hermann Göring, a state-holding company that had been established by Göring in his capacity as plenipotentiary for German economic mobilization for war and facilitated both his self-enrichment and the Nazi regime's penetration and manipulation of the German economy. It provided particularly adept, as it proved particularly adept at profiting from German expansion, particularly with the absorption of Austria and the Czech provinces of Bohemia and Moravia, the so-called protectorate, the Reichsschwerg gained a controlling position over coal, steel, and armaments produced production in these newly acquired territories. After the conquest of Poland, the Reichsschwerg quickly confiscated the various factories of the Polish state armaments works as well. Among these were the Strakowice steel and munitions factories, which in turn were operated by a Reichswerk subsidiary known as the Braunschweig Steelworks Corporation, Stahlwerk Braunschweig, GmbH. While the Reichswerk Hermann Göring also took over factories in Ostreich and Warsaw, it seems that the Strakowice factories were the crown jewel of its Polish acquisitions. For overall director of its Polish operations, Fritz Hoffmann, and the personal director, Frank Franz Kohler, Mann. No, Franz Kohler were both headquartered in Strakowice. The protection of these confiscated Strakowice factories against possible sabotage or partisan attack was in the hands of the deputy for security, Aberhunfrugeter Althoff. He had under his jurisdiction a factory guard at Wehrschutz commanded by a SS Unterschaffur Meyer. The Wehrschutz consisted of approximately 10 Germans and some 80 to 100 Ukrainians, young men from Lwów and Kowel in the eastern region of pre-war Poland that had fallen to Soviet occupation in September 1933. Though a few survivors re referred to them as ethnic Germans from the Ukraine, this is unlikely. A Jewish prisoner of Lwów who conversed in Ukrainian with guards from her hometown as well as most other survivors identified them as Ukrainian. Indeed, many Ukrainians fled the Soviet occupation during the 
population exchange permitted under the terms of the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact by claiming to be ethnic Germans who had the right to be repatriated to the Nazi sphere. When their claims were subsequently disallowed by German racial screeners, these Ukrainians were not sent back, but instead were employed by the Germans in various types of guard duty that would maximize their usefulness to the German occupiers, but minimize their contact with the Polish population. Most likely, the Strakowice workshoots comprised such men. Their primary impact on the Jewish prisoners was in guarding the perimeter of the camps and escorting the workers from the camps to their workplaces and back. The Stralnica and Mashwaka camps, which were hastily constructed by the factory management as that condition for retaining their Jewish workers, fell under Althoff's jurisdiction as he added the function of the camp commandant to his duties. Little is known about Althoff's background since after the war, he lived under the false name of Rolf Matthias Brach until his death and therefore was never subjected to judicial investigation. His original family name, in fact, had been Jaworik, which, which he legally changed to the less Polish and more German sounding Althoff in 1938. Born on March 1, 1909, in Ratibor, in Upper Silesia, he had joined the Nazi party in 1930, left for unspecified reasons, and rejoined in January 1933. According to several witnesses, Althoff was also a member of the SA. Sturmatbetlung or brown shirts, first encountered by the prisoners when they entered Strelnica after the run from the marketplace. He was also known to the prisoners as Willy Althoff. He was indelibly imprinted on the memories of survivors who subsequently experienced Auschwitz-Birkenau, many notorious camps in Germany, and the death marches. Comparatively speaking, Althoff was the worst of all, worse than all others, the worst animal, the worst of all camp commandants that I experienced, and the most horrible man in the world. These are quotes. He was a beast, a cannibal, Menschenfresser, the ultimate of sadism, a man who killed with obvious pleasure to amuse himself for fun and for sport. In his early 30s, Althoff was a good-looking young man, obviously concerned about his appearance, shunning anything as commonplace as a regular uniform. He wore a three-quarter length leather jacket lined and trimmed in white fur, tall leather boots, and white leather gloves. When he came to camp for major killing actions, however, he wore rubber coat, boots, and gloves to keep his fine clothing from being spattered with the blood of his victims. Among the prisoners, it was widely rumored that he came from a circus background. This rumor was reinforced by bizarre aspects of his behavior, such as jumping and leaping around like an acrobat, or making prisoners run in circles around him while well, he whipped them as if he were a circus animal trainer. Many of his killings were theoretically, many of his killings were theatrically staged, and he occasionally invited guests to attend his productions. His behavior was so outlandish that several survivors assumed that he was a drug addict who fell in and out of a sadistic trance. Even the Germans in Strakowice, who in post-war interrogations routinely vouched for one another as proper, sober, orderly, and humane gentlemen, did not include Althoff in this mandacious ritual of mutual whitewashing. 
According to the head of personnel, Althoff was a coarse and unstable ruffian. Ruder Holtzoffler, Holtlosser, Curl. According to the factory production manager, who subsequently also took over Althoff's job as deputy for security, he was very impulsive and hot-tempered. Ser impulsive and jagnozornig. The deputy head of accounting referred to Althoff as a swine who was extremely unpopular. Ossert unbliblebt. It's including these German terms after these words in brackets. I'm trying to say them, and I'm probably getting them wrong, but I'm trying. With the entire German staff, and the factory director noted contemptuously, despite his manly appearance, Althoff was a feminine type. He ran around scented. Althoff throws seiner malschicken Erschenung in feminier tapewar ear leaf perfumiert herum. While Althoff and Meyer would, fa- would make frequent visits to Strelnica and Majhawak, Majhawka, all too often with lethal consequences, the day-to-day management of the camps was in other hands, was in other hands. The chief camp administrator was a Soditan, a, Sudi- a Sudeten German named Waschek, who worked out of an office within the Strelnica camp. His deputy, his deputy in Mauzauka was a man named Pohl. Nothing further is known about Pohl, but Waschek was remembered on several accounts. First, a Sudeten German, he spoke Czech and could understand Polish. And second, though he was notoriously foul-mouthed and verbally abusive in sharp contrast to Althoff, he was remembered as being very decent, good to us, and the only one who had a heart. With certain exceptions, he was remembered as someone who neither beat nor killed and occasionally even protected Jewish prisoners. He was alleged to have proclaimed in vain that the Ukrainian guards had no right to beat my Jews. From the very beginning of the Nazi dictatorship in 1933, when Theodore Eich, the innovative commandant of the Dachau concentration camp and subsequently head of the SS concentration camp inspectorate, developed the Dachau model on which the subsequent concentration camp system would be based, prisoner life was dominated not only by the camp administration and guards, but also by the infamous Kapo system. Long before Jews constituted a significant portion of the camp population, the Nazis had already perfected an insidious mechanism of prisoner manipulation through divide and conquer control. Divide and control. The Strakowice slave labor camps, though run by factory managers rather than the SS, were no exception in this regard. The two key institutions for internal prisoner control were the camp council, or Lagerat, on the one hand, and the camp police, or Lagerpolizei, on the other. The entire membership of the camp council is not known, and only one source even mentions the number of members as seven. It was not merely a replica of the Wiersbenick Judenrat, for its chairman, Simka Minkberg, seems to have been totally marginalized. Not a single testimony attributes any significant role in the camps to him. But three names of former Judenrat members often surface in the survivor testimony about the Legerat, Shlomo Eisman, Moshe Berzenwig, and Rashmiel Wolfowitz. Of the three, Eisman Einesman was the only one to enjoy a decent reputation. Berenswag was characterized as not nice, a, and Wolfowitz was clearly the most detested as an unpleasant, 
corrupt and spoiled man who turned his back on his pre-war friends. According to one account, he was even cursed by his own mother for not doing good things when he was in a position to do so. The privileges enjoyed by the prisoner elite were considerable. They lived in separate housing with their wives, and in some cases with their children, whom they had been allowed to bring into camp. They were able to maintain contact with people outside the camp and even visit them in town in order to conduct business or have access to, vol valuable, to valuables hidden with friends. They controlled the access to food and clothing and thus ate and dressed relatively well, while normal prisoners of, in the camp went hungry and dressed in rags. They could allocate jobs above all assigning coveted jobs in the kitchen to family and friends. Alongside the camp council was a second internal camp institution, the camp police, whose commander, Jeremiah Wilshek, soon eclipsed all the other privileged prisoners in importance and notoriety. Wilczek already had a dubious reputation, even before the war, having served time in jail. His rumored offenses included running prostitution and dabbling in counterfeiting. Released from jail at the outbreak of the war, he knew how to make himself useful to the German police. According to Wilczek's daughter, Walter Becker frequently visited her father, her father's cigarette shop before the deportation. According to another survivor, Wilczek served as the bagman for the extortion arrests of Jews made by the feared Gendarmerie Schmidt. When the Jews arrived in Stralnica at the afternoon of October 27, 1942, the Germans had already placed Wilczek in his new position of authority. He joined Althoff in demanding that the Jews surrender their valuables. He then organized a work group of prisoners to fetch water that afternoon and the following morning. It was Wilczek who ordered the prisoners out of their barracks for work. Described as a quite ordinary man, and just a short little Jewish man, Wilczek was most often judged by survivors simply and cryptically as not a nice person and not a good man. Wilczek had more influence than, other, than any other Jew in camp to affect the fate of individual prisoners. But for a period of 21 months of incarceration in the Strakowice camps, only four witnesses attested to occasions on which he had warned, helped, or saved them. Wilczek had a few other defenders who argued that he did not actually hurt or kill anyone, and that he was also tortured the same as we were. After nearly a year in camp, he was severely beaten by Althoff's successor, and before that, Althoff did publicly humiliate Wilczek in front of the other prisoners for his own amusement. On one occasion, he poured liquor into Wilczek's mouth until he could not breathe. On another, he staged one of his degrading theatrical performances, forcing Wilczek and other members of the Lagerat to run through camp on skis. There was no snow. Well, he fired off shots. Althoff had proclaimed in front of others, all Jews will perish but you, Wilczek, will be the last in line. However, to, the, to others, Wilczek often bragged that Althoff had assured him he would kill every Jew but him. Apparently, denial of reality and delusion, delusional hope were part of what drove him. In any case, Wilczek certainly knew that his pact with Althoff, however humiliating on occasion, involved sacrificing others in order to save or at least prolong his own life. Among the overwhelming majority of survivors, the post-war memories and verdicts will check were quite negative. Three survivors did make the explicit accusation that either will check individually 
or the Jewish leadership collectively participated with the Germans in the lethal process of selecting who would die. More generally, Wilczek and the other most privileged Jews were seen as the cause and beneficiaries of a camp culture of corruption, favoritism, bribery, hierarchy, and inequality that was distinctly more pervasive in Strakowice than other camps the prisoners experienced. Wilczek commanded a small force of camp police who, whose main tasks were to assemble prisoners for the march to work and to keep other, to keep order inside the camps, which on occasion meant assisting the, with German barracks searches and selections. Since most of the Jewish ghetto police of the previous period had remained with the cleanup commando in town, after which many of them were sent elsewhere, Wilczek's camp police were for the most part newly appointed. Some were selected primarily for nepotistic reasons such as Wilczek's 18-year-old son, Abraham, Wilczek's second son, Chiel, apparently too young to be a policeman, was named a Blockalteste, or barracks supervisor. Wilczek, Wilczek's 19-year-old son-in-law, Kaim Kogut, likewise became a policeman, though his sister also attributed his appointment to the fact that the family was well off and handed over a lot of money. But Wilczek also recruited others without such connections. On the first day in Stralnica, he approached Rashmil Najman and offered him a rubber club and a position as policeman, promising him better rations and a chance to help his family. Rashmil handed back the club and turned down the offer after his wife warned him that if he took the club, he would undoubtedly have to hit people with it. Several survivors bitterly and hyper hyperbolically characterized the camp police as worse than the Germans. Orders took a more differentiated view. Others took a more differentiated view, nothing noting that some of the police were nice and a few were not. Some were bastards and some were good, and at least some were not unkind while others degenerated and abused their power unnecessarily. This last phrase about the unnecessary abuse of power is significant. The same survivor, this same survivor expressed a quite, a quite representative view the general feeling in the camp was that a genuinely fine person did not become a policeman for the Germans for any reason. Yet paradoxically, the few survivors who spoke about individually identified Jewish policemen performed an act of disassociation, judging them by particular acts of kindness and decency that they performed out of their own volition rather than by the hated functions they performed on behalf of the Germans by virtue of the position they held. Although the names of ten of Wilczek's policemen are known, Smul Sisliwi, Smul Skesliwi, and Kaim Kogut were classified as not nice by some, but were viewed favorably by others. Ezra Linson, Otto Hilf, Moshe Herblum, Goldfarb, and Turek were spoken of positively. Menek Tenzer was, demand, was deemed an angel. Only one policeman, Saja Langelben, was universally and unequivocally condemned. Not one witness credited him with even a single act of helping, warning, or saving another prisoner in the entire 21 months of incarceration in Strakowice. One survivor characterized him as a dark type who was a devoted servant of the Germans and an informer. Other, another described him as a ferocious and disgusting animal. The most controversial policemen discussed in the post-war testimonies 
and the most problematic for a historian trying to work his way through the contradictory claims and views was Jeremiah Wilczek's older son, Abraham. According to one survivor, he was like, he was, like his father, an agent of the German police in the ghetto before the deportation, who even advised his masters concerning whom to beat to get the information they wanted. From the first day in camp, the newly appointed teenage policeman was openly rude and disrespectful of the adult men and women over whom he now suddenly held authority. Several accused Abraham of responsibility for a beating received of received or for not saving a family member whom he was in a position to save. But even a survivor who said he could never forgive Abraham Wilczek admitted that over time he mellowed. One man who considered Abraham's father not a good man nonetheless conceded that in contrast, Abraham helped us a lot. Others noted specific occasions when Abraham had saved people from beatings or death. In the end, Abraham took a lead in attempting to organize resistance within the camp, escaped, survived in hiding, and then provided significant help to many survivors returning through Lodz in the post-war period. In short, Abraham Wilczek seems to have been a resentful teenager growing up in the shadow of a dubious father who, under the most unfavorable and potentially corrupting conditions, matured into a quite different person. So that was chapter 10 